What's happening? What's happening, Mr. Nick Miller? Uh, I'm not a whole lot. I'm hanging out with here with uh, with Tommy, Mr. Tommy Van Arsdale. Hello. Hello, you two Chicago people. My wife is from Berwyn. You guys from anywhere around there? I live in Logan Square, which is like pretty much dead center in the middle of the city. Yeah, and I'm I'm humble. <laughs> that makes you a White Sox fan, right? <laughs> 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 I'm wearing gray socks right now, though. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you. One of the things about uh, musicians that come out of Chicago right away, you know, I mean, our our minds, we we sit there and start thinking about the legends that that have come from that city, and that means that you guys are carrying that torch forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's an incredible city. There's just so much. I mean, between sports and entertainment and just like culture, it's it's a pretty cool place. It uh, it definitely lends itself to being an artist and a musician. Um, you know, we tend to make jokes every so often that, you know, like it doesn't matter how many people find out about our band in all reality. If we just like stayed in Chicago, we could probably still be a legitimate professional playing out band. <laughs> well, no, I, I totally understand that because my wife's ex-husband uh, went from Chicago to Los Angeles. And, and, the, and that was the thing about it. I mean, everybody makes that big move out to California, so, but you guys have remained pretty true to the roots. Well, I mean, sort of like, uh, I don't think anybody in the band is actually from Chicago. We've all moved here <laughs> at some point in time in our lives. Um, but the funny thing is, is that a majority of the people that I meet in Chicago I'm from Chicago, and the majority of the people that I meet in Denver are from Chicago. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's it's yeah. So like, but otherwise, like, there I really don't see us having a like a more beneficial position being out in L.A. Other than just having nice nicer weather, not having to shovel snow. <laughs> yeah, not the dang truth. It's so funny you say that because my my wife's uh, sister last night wrote to us because we're here in the Carolinas. She says, "Do you guys even have winter?" Well, yeah, we're living it right now. We're in the forties up to sixties. Yeah. Oh, you poor thing. Yeah, yeah. You sound like my dad and my mom when they go to Florida. Now, where, where in uh, the Carolinas are you? Well, right right now we're on this beautiful lake called Lake Wiley in, in the Charlotte Rock Hill area. So, I mean, that's what I, I love about I know it. Well. Oh, my God. It's just so gorgeous out here, especially today because we're about 65 degrees. So, I mean, it's like, okay, it's it's springtime. Yeah, my my uh, I'm actually from Wilmington, North oh, Carolina. Oh, jeez! Oh my God! I feel bad for my parents. Yeah, that brings an interesting twist to the band because I mean, there's something in the soil in Carolina that that travels across the nation and changes things, man. I mean, there's there's like some soul in our soil. Absolutely. Well, it's you know, I always say growing up, I was extremely lucky because you know, we, I, jazz history is just such an, an indelible part of the state. You know, between like Thelonious Monk and. Um, you know, Nina Simone, Max Roach. I mean, there's just some really incredible musicians that came out of the Carolinas um, that went on to do amazing things for the genres of jazz and R&B and, and rock and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great place for sure. Uh, my parents certainly love it. They get to walk the beach every day and I get to you know, <laughs> shovel snow. It's a good trade off. We had we had lunch out on the pier, which which now stretches out into Lake Wiley, dude. I mean, it's a, it's like you just walk out there and you're in the middle of the lake on this pier. Awesome, man. Yeah, yeah hopefully Tommy will take us to his hometown to play a show and we can come see that. For well, yeah. sure. Have, do you, have you guys traveled down to Charlotte to play at the, the NC Music Factory or anything like that? No, we will. That's that's part of the plan. I mean, we did a, a miniature tour this past summer. Actually, we did a couple of miniature tours, uh, but it was mostly the Midwest and um, like the Northeast. Uh, we hit Pittsburgh, which was an incredible time. And nice. That's one of our goals for, you know, the next, I would say, 18 months is to do something in the in the South, uh, hopefully like, you know, also visit the Northeast again, but give some love to that part of the country. Isn't that a great vision to have? Because I'll tell you what, about three years ago, the, uh, the artists that I were talking to didn't have that vision. They, there, there was a sense of lost hope. And I, I just love the way that people talk about their future now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. You know, a lot of people really didn't know when or where they're going to be able to travel and go out and play shows again. So it'd be really hard to kind of think about that kind of stuff. But I mean, honestly, I want to Tennessee, New Orleans, Texas. Like, I want to get out there. Um, it's been forever since I've been to Tennessee. So I, I, I want to get out there and play those play those markets and meet people. You got to talk to me about the harmonies of, of your music, because, I mean, a lot of so many different direct, directors or, or, or engineers don't, you know, they, they, they don't like to run to the harmony as the hook. But yet you guys really play with that quite well. I appreciate that. It's really nice of you to say, and I'm glad that you caught that. Um, honestly, that's kind of 
that's a little new for for me and our, our singer guitar player Nick Kinsley for us to kind of do that stuff. But we're big Thin Lizzy fans. Oh God! Uh, so like when when we we when we do that kind of stuff, we we try to lean into it a little bit. We're like, okay, well if we're gonna do this, we're gonna make it uh, like a prominent part that people can focus on. Um, otherwise, it's it's just it's just filler, you know. Um, and we don't like to write anything to be filler. No, no, there isn't a single song that we have that we wrote a part that was just like thrown in there to like yeah. take up time or space. Uh, and so like the more that we kind of play around with that, those kind of things, the more that like, if it makes, you know, me and Nick smile real big where we're playing it and we're having a great time, we know that's going to translate to the audience. I, I, I've been with Thin Lizzy and, and the way that they build a song and how they transition from being just regular everyday people into creating music. Sure, it's a journey that, that, you know, that a lot of people don't understand because it's about exploration. And I love the idea that you've been bitten by that bug. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the most fun part about this band is that. We, we we set out with an intention that has basically you know been thrown to the wayside at this point and now we just kind of like write however we're kind of feeling about the song um and it's we, we we don't we don't box ourselves in into any sort of like genre rules or anything like that i mean we have a tendency of of having our uh our habits and the things that are comfortable for us but it allows us to kind of go all over the place with that stuff you know like one song might sound like a like a, a more straightforward hardcore song but then it goes into like a like a grunge influenced chorus, you know. It's just kind of like what, whatever we're feeling at the time that we're writing the part. Do you feel trapped these days only because there are so many different genres of music, and you've got to come up with some sort of a label in order to put yourself out there? But yet, listeners don't think like that at all. When they hear great music, they take it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, we we're listeners, so yeah. we we just listen to music that we love, and that's honestly how we formed in the first place was being listeners and talking about music and then saying, well, why don't we, why don't we see what we could do? Let's create the music that we want to listen to. And so I think that kind of permeates the way in which we write and which we play. If we can make each other laugh through a part, then that that's the goal. You know, if, if there's a, a four beat measure that we need some kind of count in, it's hilarious. You know, Nick Miller will just say, let's, let's throw on, you know, quarter <laughs> notes on the cowbell. And then the second that we try that out, all of us are laughing hysterically and we're like, all right, keep it. That's going in. Yeah. You know, so for us, it's like labels. I mean, they're they're necessary to a degree when talking about music and I think framing, you know, the context of comparisons. But at the end of the day, it means as much to us as it as it as it should to anybody, which is very little. I mean, if you like something, you like something. There's no need to put a label or give a reason for why. The hardest thing with labeling would have been more like communicating with the music industry, mm-hmm. you know, because they require us to label ourselves. Um, but when we're talking to other when we're talking to just, you know, friends and fans and stuff like that. It's just fun to kind of see what they think we we are and who we sound like and stuff like that. Although, I mean, like we we really try hard not to lead people to any sort of expectation um, unless we have to. And usually that's when we're interacting with, you know, talent buyers or you know, people in the music industry, they're the ones that are always kind of requiring some sort of explanation up front. Well, what I love about modern day classic rock stations is that the old timers of the classic rock are basically stepping away from it to go do their own thing. And that's opened up the door because, and these new program directors are saying, Hey, look, I don't want to be the city's oldies station. I want to be a great rock station. And that opens up the door for the dust biters to step right in. Absolutely. And look at some radio stations in Chicago, like Lumpen Radio. They've got programs that, you know, like the Minimal Beat or What Day Is It? That's it's there's no genre. I mean, that's right. the point. The point is the DJ is just picking an hour or two hours of songs that just coalesce within themselves. So you can transition from Chicago, you know, house music to rock to electronica. I've heard jazz. I mean, it's the point is, you know, what music makes sense working together, whether that's a feeling or a concept or you know, something just completely nebulous, you know, could just be so here are songs that uh, start with, you know, the letter O or here's, you know, uh, <laughs> songs that are from bands with only two members, you know, so that's just way more important of like, I think, characterizing what feels right and, and you know, can be, I don't know, compared together versus just cross genre. I also think that there's been like a lot of fun with like, you know, talent buyers and promoters putting together mixed genre shows in general i think we're seeing a really good response to people that like a variety and and you can gather a lot more people in one room if every band doesn't sound you know like one degree away from the band before it um it, it, you can that's how you make new fans you get exposed to new people you get exposed to new types of music 
Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really cool to kind of see that kind of stuff getting away from like, okay, we got to follow this very specific parameter in order for it to either like work on this lineup or to work on this radio show. Because eventually people are going to be like, all right, I've heard what I need to hear, and they're going to switch over. Yeah, yeah. Yep. See, I run into that on my dance floor because when I have a 35 to 40-year-old male out there on the floor and he's out there dancing with an 85-year-old woman, to me it's in the beat. And when you guys bring a beat to that floor and I take a chance on that song, all of a sudden it's, it keeps everybody going forward. Agreed. Yeah. The album cover. Whose idea was this? Because, I mean, this, this, there's, a, there's a spiritual mystery to it. it, it it's like the, the edge of replenishing. Oh, wow. Um, so the album cover was uh, kind of a journey. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we went back and forth on what we wanted to do, uh, and we kind of like started just sourcing some different imagery that we would share in our group text. And uh, one night, me and Nick were kind of like sitting around discussing things, and we were just like kind of like just, you know, Google image searching and stuff. And we were looking up like really creepy old uh, you know, like the <laughs> Depression Day era, like costumes, like Halloween costumes, like like things that were extremely homemade with very limited resources. And these those kids with like the super creepy masks on um, the three kids on the front with like the giant weird oversized, uh, you know, paper mache <laughs> heads and stuff like that. That's where we kind of got a lot of those images from. And then we were really lucky. We found a artist online that did like these kind of cool collage type pieces. Um, you know, obviously he made them modern and digital, but he really liked our music. And when we kind of pitched to him, you know, like, Hey, here's some of our influences, you know, refused is a big influence for us. Yeah, yeah. And the album cover for the shape of punk to come is just such a cool, you know, iconic album cover. Like if you're a fan of that kind of music and you see that, you know, who, what band that is like, and there isn't a single image of anybody in the band on the cover. Yeah. But you know what that is. Um, And that was kind of like the one thing that we all discussed. We wanted something that, you know, I I mean, I don't I don't want to go as bold to say iconic, but we wanted something that was like, you know, like if you saw it, you recognize that that was our album. That's so interesting. You bring that up because in my notes, I say you don't waste any time showcasing the guitars on your song. This is about you. And then you're telling me this right now. It's like it's like, oh, my God, we all get it on this side. And because you brought it forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. To be in that moment, that's that's chance taking, and 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 but but yet we we live in this era where chance taking has got to be the golden rule. Absolutely, I mean, I think at the end of the day, some kind of randomization or or ability to be spontaneous is what keeps things fresh and and honest. So we definitely try to, you know, involve a degree of randomness and and sort of like leading by feeling um, in the way in which we write and solo and perform and whatnot. And so having an album cover that's more emotive necessarily mm-hmm. than, uh, um, than explicit was something that we were really intentional about in discussing the, the concept. And I think that we, we really enjoy leaving things up to interpretation. Um, I think that that's what allows somebody to, to remain a fan of something is that if you still have something to figure out, uh, then you know, like you can go back to it over and over and over again. I mean, there are there are albums that to this day I still go back and dissect. You know, song structure, lyrics, things like that. Since you know, since I was in high school, we're talking twenty plus years at this point. But those are really, really important albums, in my opinion. The ones that I still can't quite fully figure out what they were trying to express. <laughs> but you know, I was I was talking to the director of this new uh, docu series about music called Mixtape, and I said, you know, there's there's a bunch of artists out there that want are are facing and basing everything that they do on interpretation. She says, give me five minutes with them, I'll break them down because I want to know, and that's what I'm going to put in this documentary. I want to be in the documentary because that sounds like a fun challenge. <laughs> I would say look, look to Brian Eno's oblique strategies, you know, like there's just, just the way in which people kind of uh, create ideas and are inspired is just so fascinating. I mean, I could spend hours just reading interviews with people and, and how they come up with stuff. And I, I still would just, you know, there's just so much out there in regards to how creative people, you know, in, get inspired and, and continue to create. I think it's really amazing. What What is the playing field like for you when you hear someone like a ZZ Top or even a, a you know even like a member of Kiss and they they say yeah we wrote that song in twenty minutes and and we had it tracked in no time and it's like it's like wow that's all you put into it. I mean do you, do you, do you feel unique or do you feel like well God we've got to get to that point where we can just do it in twenty minutes? 
so we we've we've had songs like that uh pray for me came together within a few hours i would say at least maybe a day or two that was a song that we just we started riffing on it and uh nick brought kind of the main riff and it just things just kind of clicked um and it's it's such a fun song to play but that just came very naturally and then there's other songs like one uh that we just finished uh, which has not been recorded yet called bittersweet Mm. which took months you know it was we had a couple of really great ideas and we were leading by feeling you know once again but we couldn't quite get things to connect naturally so we just kept coming back to it every practice and making small adjustments so i think yeah absolutely if we could just go ahead and crank out zz top songs in a matter of minutes (laughs) that would be incredible but um at the same time it's kind of nice to have the juxtaposition to uh songs that come out in flow versus something that does require a little bit of finessing and, and glitter. So we've had both. And, and I'd like to continue to think that we can have, a, you know, a, a equal balance of the two. There's also um, just to add on to that, too. I think there, there's something to say. Is that the best choice for the song? We It winds up becoming overly complicated, um, really convoluted. And then by the end of like the fifth attempt of trying to do something, we're throwing it out and going back to the original riff anyways. Yep. So, you know, like just lessons i've learned over the years of writing music is that if if it's flowing naturally and it's coming the easiest it's most likely the best thing to do do you go by the same rule that carlos santana and even neil Neil sean does is it that that you don't set out to write a great rock song what you do is you go out there to plant the attitude and the and the listener is the one that makes the great rock song in the way that it because it's in their attitude their lifestyle and their choices uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, like, it's hard to argue with that perspective. I can't say that, like, that that is our main intention. But again, this kind of goes back to like leaving everything up to interpretation. Like, we're yeah. trying to just write songs that make us happy and and like you know, like we're satisfied with. And we typically can usually tell which ones are going to get a little bit better of a response and which ones you know take some chewing on to you know really kind of sink in. Um, but I mean, ideally, you know, like we just want to write things that sound good to us. And if it sounds good to the four of us, then we're, we're pretty positive. Like we're pretty confident that it's going to translate and that the, the, the audience that we're trying to seek out will enjoy the songs. Yeah. Yeah. How do you take it to the, to the road? Because being in the studio is one thing, but when you take it to the road and you've got a whole complete different acoustic set there, I mean, what, what happens? It's tough. I mean, just the (laughs) road in general is abusive but I think like everyone that's ever toured will tell you, it's also probably the most enjoyable thing you could possibly do. So we, we have a, I would say a healthy balance of loving the studio as much as we love the road. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite arduous for sure. So um, songs like Goddamn Guilt, which is the last song on the album Guilt, uh, have took us a little bit of time to figure out how we were going to uh, kind of interpret that for a live setting, because mm-hmm. when we wrote the song, it wasn't uh, kind of an orthodox way of writing it. We recorded things in parts, like, for instance, each one of my drums was actually recorded individually. So we would record wow. a Tom hit, and bass drum hit and et cetera, et cetera. And then we assembled that song in the studio, uh, which was a really amazing process because that was the first time any of us had done something like that. So we wrote for the song. But again, so many people like that song, they wanted to hear it live, so we had to figure out how to play that live. It's not the same live as it is in the studio. We also don't want it to be the same. Right. But challenges like that, I think, are really fun for us as musicians and keep things fresh. So, yeah, absolutely. I could see us do things you know, like that in the future. Wow, it was Les Paul that's always been credited for creating the tracking and stuff like that in a studio. Can you imagine if that man would not have taken a chance on tracking? Because, I mean, what we do with the different tracks today is just mind-blowing. And I think that it would have made him go, whoa, my God. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, that's a really, really good point. I mean, we recently did, um, we had a questionnaire that we answered. And one of them was like, you know, like, if you could sit in on any recording session, what would it be? And my answer, you know, like, it's like Pink Floyd, yeah, um, Dark Side of the Moon. And, you know, like, obviously, most people would be like, oh, yeah, I mean, anybody would want to sit in with Pink Floyd. And it's like, oh, you don't understand. Like, everything was so thoughtful and on purpose. And they were dealing with like eight tracks. <laughs> you know, and like they were bouncing, they were bouncing things, like they were bouncing entire mixes down onto one track, and once that was layered onto one track, it was set. Yep. There was like nothing left that you could do. You can't go back and relayer that, otherwise you got to start over. And to be that well versed in what you're doing and recording an album and being aware of where the final product needs to get to is just so impressive and so incredible. Because now. I mean, when we were writing the, like like the leads and adding in the ear candy on our album, it was just like, uh, 
let me just lay this down. We'll listen to it for a couple of days, come back, erase it, try it again. Um, oh, that sounds cool. Let's layer some, you know, piano effects on top of that and see how that sounds. Ah, that doesn't really work. Let's try some strings. And it was just incredible that we were able to just like do, we could have a symphony of instruments at our disposal and a million different tracks to try them out on. And then you have bands like, yeah, Pink Floyd and Beatles and every great band that's ever come before, you know, digital audio interfaces <laughs> that, that was doing these things with, you know, next to nothing. And they were hand cutting tape and gluing it together. <laughs> when you talk of about a dark side of the moon, I, I got to tell you, my generation, and I, I don't know if you guys uh, know the story as well, but it was so associated with the Wizard of Oz that if you place it at the beginning, start playing it by the time and turn down the Wizard of Oz, it goes perfectly well with the movie. Oh, yeah. I, I went to college. We did that yeah. with, with rec <laughs> recreational assistance for the yeah. experience. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so where can people go to find out more about you guys? Because like you said, you're building a tour right now and, and people are going to want to know, A, where, the, where can they get the music? What's the tour going to be? And more importantly, the merchandise, because that album cover, is you're, you're going to be signing a lot of those. Oh, man, that's really nice of you to say. I appreciate that. Um, Dustbitersband.com, you can find our store on there. So if you want to get a copy of the 7-inch, uh, the cassette tapes, we have two different colors there. We have physical CDs that are available. We have a band camp. Um, all of our music is available digitally. So anywhere that you listen to music, if it's Spotify, iTunes, Deezer, wherever the heck it is, we're on all of those. So just search Dustbiters. Um, the social media that we send to send everybody to is our Instagram we just tend to have a little bit more fun there. That's where we're a little bit where that's where the we're the most active. So that's Dust Fighters official. You guys definitely went the route of the cassette. That that seems to be the big thing right now. You've got to release the cassettes. It's fun and it's easy and it's it's also cheap to uh, to purchase. <laughs> so our goal is to get something in your hands. I think it's the easiest way to remember us and and to kind of you know interact physically. And as you mentioned, the cover is is something that's really emotive. So we want people to hold on to that. You know, physically, it's something we love physical media. I mean, all of us are collectors at the same time. So just to be able to release something on cassette was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, in addition to those, I would say our YouTube as well, because we just released a video for the song Progeny a couple weeks ago, which we had an incredible time filming. There's some really crazy stories about the production on that. But we'd love for people to watch that and give us feedback in the comments or reach out to us, you know, through DM or email and, and tell us what songs they want us to make music videos for. What, what kind of stuff that they uh, they like about us. Because right now we are just in a creative mode, especially during, as nice. we've been talking about, Chicago winter. So it's just like, go, go, go. <laughs> let's make some fun songs. Let's crank out some cool content. And let's prep for the summer. Hopefully we can get to uh, to a city near everybody. Absolutely. you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you guys. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely like hit you up the next time that we have something new to put out there uh, and talk about. Um, but we are we are discussing with a, with a few different bands about doing like another Midwest run. Nice. Um, just just because we, we we have friends all over the Midwest, so it's really easy for us to like just kind of you know book a couple shows, and we're gonna wait until yeah the weather chills out, and we we, we have a lot of writing to do right now. We're we're finishing up three new songs, uh, potentially a fourth. We already have like the material for it. We really want to. We really want to find the time to put together a cover. Um, so yeah, we want to like have all of this stuff ready to go because you know, like if people really like this album and like the, the response that we're getting right now, they're going to be ready for us to start putting out new stuff by the you know like come summertime. So we want to be ready for it. Oh my God, you sound like Tommy Shaw. Tommy Shaw did the same thing before becoming a member of Styx. I mean, everything you just said is something that he would tell me. I mean, I, you are so spot <laughs> on, man. I will take that comparison all day long. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys be brilliant today, okay? Thank you, man. Same Thank to you. you. Appreciate you having us. You bet. Bye, guys. Bye.